morning, Wanda. Good morning. Hi, I'm really glad to be meeting with you. Thanks for meeting with me. I feel kind of silly asking some of these questions, but um, I, I'm hoping you might be able to help me handle a few different things. Um, I thought I could do it on my own, but now it's week five and my first semester of teaching and I'm trying to, you know, keep my class in order, but some of the things I've tried hasn't really worked. Mm -hmm. So I heard that I might be able to connect um, with someone from teaching and learning to see if you could offer me any other strategies. It's a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, absolutely. Of course we can. And I want to start off too by saying um, you're not alone, right? There's a lot of faculty, especially new faculty who are facing some of these challenges. So I'm really glad that you've reached out. And yes, we're going to talk through a few more specifics and then hopefully you'll, you'll be able to walk away with a few strategies to try next week in class. So yeah, what I'm hearing from you so far is that you're facing some classroom management challenges. Yes. Okay, so can you tell me a little bit more sort of specifically what's going on in your class and what you're struggling with? Um, well, one of the biggest things is students talking. So having little side conversations, it's really getting to me and I find it really distracting and sometimes it makes me lose my train of thought if I see other side conversations happening. And I say, you know, be quiet, be quiet. You know, I can say it 17 times, but they just don't want to listen. They keep carrying on the conversations with their friends at their table and they don't even seem to hear me and they don't even seem to care. Yeah, that can be really hard, right? And I mean, a number of faculty that I consult with regularly often interpret that as almost a sign of disrespect or you just think what's going on here like we you know we came here to cover this content together and and it's they're making it challenging with these side conversations um yeah so that can definitely be very difficult to face but as I mentioned it also is really common so you're you're really not alone in that and I do have some ideas that you can try out and um okay so let me just get a sense so let's say they're talking, you say, okay, please listen. They don't stop talking, then what do you do? Well, I try and just um, raise my voice a little bit more to talk over them. Not, not yelling, but try mm -hmm. to talk over them to see if that will kind of settle them down. Okay, and that doesn't typically work. It's, it's not really working, no. I just, I have so much to get through that I have all this content that I have to cover and I and I just need to try and get through it. So I'm trying to, you know, just talk over them so I can get through what I need to in my class with my, you know, short time frame. Right, of course. Yeah. And so that that must feel like a lot of pressure to yeah. Yeah. And, the... and I I thought that I thought that they were coming in and going to want to, you know, be there and learn. So it was this has been surprising for me. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, already they are showing up, right? The fact that you've got students in the room <laughs> means that they do care yeah. and they want to be there and, and learn from you and each other and cover this content. But uh, yes, I know sometimes things feel like they're a little bit out of control with the chatter in the class. So I'm going to share with you, there are these kind of three rules that a lot of us folks in teaching and learning share with faculty and faculty report back that they find them tremendously helpful. All of us teaching and learning consultants also teach at least one course a year to students at, at Conestoga. And so we put this into practice ourselves as well. And it seems to help, certainly in my classes it does. Um, so there are these three rules that, I mean, in an ideal world, you'd set very clearly at the, you know, in the very first class at the start of the semester, but it's not too late to do it now. So we'll walk through maybe how you might incorporate them, you know, in week six next week. But uh, essentially they are, no one talks when I'm talking for the reasons that you just described, right? When you're introduced this rule, you can say, listen, I have a really hard time teaching when I hear chatter at the back and I want to perform my best here. I've planned an amazing lesson for you and I'm so excited to deliver it, but I get thrown off when I hear voices all around the room. So no one talks when I'm talking, that's just a rule. And if I see anybody violating it, I'm going to stop the class and wait until the talking stops so I can continue. Um, so that's rule number one. And then also no one talks when a peer or colleague is donating or offering something to the class, right? Because I've been in situations where 
maybe students are listening to me when I'm speaking, but then suddenly their colleague who maybe has a slightly quieter voice or, you know, maybe they're not mm. sure what they're saying, et cetera. And they start talking over one of their peers' contributions. And so this rule is very important too. And it creates this community of, of an environment of respect and safety where we value all voices and contributions. So same thing. I say, you know, it's part of my teaching philosophy. It's vital to this field that we're, you're all learning to work within that we get really good at listening to each other. And so I'm also going to stop class or I'll, you know, ask the person who's contributing to pause for a moment if I hear chatter going on. Um, because that is a sign of respect and we want to make sure everyone's heard. And then the third one is that everyone is on task unless I've been notified that there's a good reason that you're not, right? So sometimes um, things come up. We all have complicated lives outside of the classroom and we are not the bosses of these students, right? They're, it's not a workplace situation. They are volunteering to come to, to this class. It's an agreement. I'm there to teach them. But I and I have to manage the class, but I'm not their boss. And so if there is, you know, a particular day where they have to take a phone call outside because something's happening in their family, etc. That's OK. I just ask that they let me know. They don't have to let me know specifics, right? Privacy reasons. But if they just say to me, you know, halfway through the class, I'm going to get this important phone call. I'm going to have to step out of the room. I'll say, oh, yeah, thanks for telling me. That's great. Maybe I've broken groups, you know, the class up into small groups to do a little active learning activity. I'm sort of floating around from group to group and suddenly there's a group that's not on task. I'm going to say, whoa, what's happening here? <laughs> and, you know, because of this rule, they're going to have permission to say, oh, you know, actually, this happened to me the other day in class. Actually, you know, this, this one group member's father hurt himself and we don't know what hospital is closest. So sometimes there's a really good reason students are not on class and they're searching on their phone for like what hospital to recommend to this yeah. guy. Um, and that really humanizes the situation, right? You're not militant about being on task. You're saying, this is really important. We got to cover this material. And my expectation is if you're here, you're engaging in what I'm inviting you to engage with. But there's room for, for some humanness. Let's just be, you know, upfront about it. So a lot of faculty find if they really set these three rules at the start of the semester, often have them written down. I think multiple places is great, right? Even if you write it on a piece of paper and you tape it to the board every class, um, just so they're very present. You might want to also include it in the classroom announcements, maybe even the week before class starts. And then just stick to them. That's the the real key here is the consistency, because if in week three, someone's offering something in one corner and the chatter happens and you don't kind of put an end to it right in that moment, um, that's going to set a trend, right? And students are going to say, oh, these rules are actually not that important. And we can sort of haphazardly break them or apply them whenever. So it's really about being consistent, even if in those early days, it takes a little bit of extra time away from covering the content that, you know, you've, you've set probably by the minute on your lesson plan. Mm -hmm. so, well, yeah. 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 Do so you, you think, think, you think even though it's week five, I should, I should be kind of starting from the beginning and, and, you know, putting up classroom rules on a, on a piece of paper and putting them in announcements. I don't think there's any harm in, in trying it now, right? And I think if you come at it from a place saying to students, you know, we're on the same team here. Like you're paying a lot of money to be here. I'm paid the same no matter what happens in this right. in the bathroom, right? Like I'm here, I'm showing up on time. I'm ready to teach you. It seems that you've agreed to be here and you've made an effort, you know, with, with everything going on in your busy lives to actually show up. Let's make the best of these two, three, seven hours that we have together. Um, and if you come at it, say, wow, you know, we're almost at the midway point or we're, you know, one third of the way through the semester. And I'm noticing that this is getting tricky and it's preventing me from teaching you to the best of my abilities. It's preventing some students mm -hmm. from learning to the best of their abilities. And it's, you know, I'm not feeling great about the classroom environment right now. So it's really important to me. We're going to stick to these rules from here on in. Um, you know, I, I would love for you to give it a try and report back to me in two or three weeks and let me know how that's been going. And if there's been moments where it's hard to be very consistent and, and stick to them or, or how students have reacted. But I think often if you come at it from a place of care and say, wow, 
I feel like we're going in this direction and we need to change course for all of our benefit. And it's going to make us, you know, learn better, enjoy each other's company more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so um, why don't we talk a little bit about what might happen? So let's say you have those rules in place and then talking continues, right? So maybe you remind by the rules and that doesn't help. What, what else do you think you might try? Um, I don't really know what else I can do other than, you know, please stop talking. Um, pause, I think that you mentioned to kind of wait. Mm -hmm. um, and if another student is talking, I guess the same thing. And sometimes you can announce it, right? So oftentimes, and depending, this really varies from group to group, right? And even the type of classroom you're in will change a little bit of the suggestions that I'm about to offer you. But um, often silence works, right? And sometimes, again, it's that, that idea of commitment. So if you, let's say you're in the middle of a sentence, you're sharing some content, pointing out something on the slide on the board, and you hear chatter, sometimes you just stop talking, wait, you might look in that student's direction. Give it sufficient time, right? So it's going to feel uncomfortable a little bit. The other student's eyes will be on you. You might feel bad because they are there and they were listening and they want to learn. Um, but I promise you in the end, they will be glad that you've put a stop to this so that the rest of the class can run more smoothly. So sometimes, yeah, you just wait. Okay. You don't, you don't think the rest of them who are, you know, there and wanting to listen are going to be upset because I'm wasting time by by pausing? No, I think really it reaffirms the faith that they have in you as a classroom manager. And because if, okay. if you're noticing it and you're frustrated by it and it's, you know, throwing you off course, it's happening to them too. It's happening to students mm. where being really attentive. So I think okay. it's annoying in the moment, right? No one wants to have to be out there and yeah. kind of staring. Yeah. Um, but you know, I don't think any of the attentive students would object at the end of the class that you that you really were, you know, putting your foot down there. And and sometimes if they don't notice after a while, I might raise my voice slightly <clears throat> and say something like, you know, I was really excited to share this piece of information with you, whatever it might be. Um, and I'm a little disappointed that there's so much talk happening at the back of the class because mm -hmm. it's making it challenging for me, making it challenging for the ones who are trying to listen. So I'm feeling pretty disappointed right now, especially given that we just talked about these rules. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to wait up here until everyone's quiet. If you have something really pressing to discuss, you're welcome to go into the hall and do it. If you can wait to, till break time, even better. But I can't continue teaching with this kind of talk at the back of the room. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And then, yeah, and then wait a little bit. Um, sometimes there's other strategies, right? If it's not, if it's just like a little kind of whisper or something like that, that you sense might turn into a bigger conversation, what I might do if, you know, in an in-person class, is just slowly, I might keep talking about the content I'm presenting and just slowly walk over to that part of the room, right? Students are going to notice that. Um, they, they might not even realize that, you know, their whisper was audible <laughs> from others, but if I start to walk over mm -hmm. there, there's very gentle classroom management strategy, depending on the students. And again, the layout of the room, you know, I might slowly put my hand on, on the desk. If I'm talking to, you know, the team on the rest of the class on this side and the problematic table is over here, I might just slowly, you know, keep presenting content, but just lay my hand on the desk near where the students are speaking. And oftentimes they'll get the message and quiet down with that too. It doesn't mm -hmm. always have to be a dramatic, dramatic pause if you sense it's kind of yeah, the beginnings of maybe a bigger, a bigger conversation that might take mm. place. Um, another strategy too is, uh, you know, essentially saying, oh, wow, I'm hearing some, some voices at the back of the room. Uh, do you folks have a question about this? Or is there something you wanted to contribute to the discussion? Okay. And then it'll put them on the spot in this gentle way. And they might say, oh, no, sorry, sorry. <laughs> and, and quiet okay. down. So that's, you know, another, another thing to try. Okay. All right. Thank you. Those are all really interesting. And I will try to see if I can do some of those. I mean, I will say it takes practice too, right? And it might feel uncomfortable at the beginning. Um, 
But that's the beautiful thing about teaching is you get better at it. Everything you try, right? And you learn from those experiences. And also, if you're teaching, say, two sections of the exact same course, your class on Monday night might, might respond really well to the silent strategy. And then maybe your class on Tuesday morning doesn't, right? Maybe they're more, you've got to use these proxemics and eye contact and move around the room just to make sure everyone's engaged. And uh, maybe that strategy works better for them. So it's not, it's good to have a variety of different tools in your tool belt that you can think, hmm, right. Right today, why not? All right, I've got this backup tool. Um, and the more you use all of them, the more comfortable you'll you'll get at it, right? Because you'll see that they work and then you'll have the confidence too to say, okay, I'm just going to hold this silence for another minute and remind students that I'm paid the same, whether they're listening or not, whether I right. <laughs> get through all these slides or not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Um, well, thanks for those suggestions. Um, I was just thinking about about the one we were talking about earlier and the pausing. I feel like it might be a little bit embarrassing for me to be, you know, just waiting and, but I'll, I'll give it a try. But what if they just keep talking? Um, so what if I try all these things and, you know, they're still talking? Can I just ask them to leave? Can, can I ask them to step out and leave? They obviously don't want to be there if that's the case. I would suggest no. I think that, um, you know, if we think of the classroom as a community, that would essentially be kind of excommunicating individuals from the community. And while it might say, I can understand the impulse, right? Um, mm. To exert that sort of power and say, okay, that's it. Like I warned you, you're not following the rules. It was very clear. Um, but I think it could really do something to the overall classroom community. You know, if students see that their peers have been excommunicated for certain behaviors, they're going to start to fear that that they might be. I would suggest instead maybe saying, if it's really bad and all the other strategies haven't worked, saying, wow, okay, um, this isn't working. We're going to do a little break right now for five minutes. I'm going to just check in with, with a few of you during this break. So rather than kick them out of class, give everyone else a little break. You can take that time to go up to them and say, this really isn't working for me. What's up? Uh, you know, and then sometimes you do get more information from them, right? Maybe they are having a really good reason for talking. Maybe something dramatic is happening in their lives that then, you know, you'd, you'd follow through with. But yeah, I think that sort of excommunication is dangerous. And again, as much as many faculty at the college are industry professionals, they're not gatekeepers to the profession, right? They're there to offer their advice, their expertise to students. They're there to teach with solid lesson plans to get students excited about this learning, but we're not their managers. We're not their bosses. They're not being paid to be here. Um, and and mm -hmm. they have a right to be in class unless they're really violating some of their responsibilities, right? Or causing deliberate harm to, to other students in some way. So Great. yeah, I would say no. And I mean, in the long run too, yes, we're educating them about a certain field of study, which they may or may not decide to go into for their future careers, but we're also educating like democratic citizens to live in this society. And so mm -hmm. I like to think of the classroom environment too as being this, you know, this kind of petri dish almost of like, okay, yeah, sometimes there's gonna be conflicts and how can I also model ways to work through this with compassion and empathy, um, you know, and expertise, of course. And so um, I think that, you know, maybe not right away, you won't see, see how, you know, the seeds that you're planting in that moment maybe flourish and thrive in the, the next few weeks. But I think over the long term, students will remember if they felt welcome in a particular classroom community or you know that you were attentive to their needs and really what was going on and yeah and sometimes it takes critical thinking and creativity to resolve some of these problems and if you're able to model that in the classroom all the better one of the one of the other strategies if things are really kind of getting out of hand is I would say coming back to them as a team and if you've tried the silence if you've tried you know walking around the room um, the little break and it's still happening. I've had success sometimes just saying like, wow, I'm so confused. I'm so confused, everyone. I know you're such smart, caring people because I've gotten to know you over the past couple of weeks. I've read your assignments. I really appreciate the time we have together in class together. 
And yet we're finding this really difficult to follow these three rules. So what is going on? What can we do? Because I've already told you, I can't teach in this way. Maybe you have other teachers in the program or, you know, classes you're taking this semester where they can totally function with noise all around. That's them. For me, I've told you, like, personally, I can't. And so we need to work together to solve this problem. And sometimes that mentality of getting really curious, <laughs> even if you are mad, right? Like, sometimes I'm bubbling with rage underneath, yeah. and thinking, like, stop talking. But, but taking this approach of curiosity and saying, we're on the same team here. Like, we're in the same place with the same objective. We need to work together to resolve this. I've tried my strategies. What, what do you think? What are some other ideas from the group? that we can get this talking to stop and we can all feel respected in this space. And sometimes too, that, you know, that pulls on their, their empathy and, yeah. and it does, again, if we're, we're also really educating future democratic citizens, empowers them in some ways to think, oh, she's coming to me for a solution. Oh, maybe I do have an idea or maybe we can make change when things get tricky. So um, that's a strategy too I've tried from time to time when things get really, really complicated. Yeah. Okay. I'll try that. Maybe there's something that I'm missing that they will offer up, I guess, if I ask, if it gets to that. Um, <clears throat> while I have you, I have, I have one more thing I was just going to ask you about. Yeah. Um, I teach a class around lunchtime. And um, I, I do have a few students who come in late, sometimes 20 or 30 minutes after the class started and they bring lunch with them. So they'll walk in with like a full pizza and chatting the whole time that they're walking in. And, um, you know, they have no regard for what's going on. And I just feel like it's very disrespectful for me and, you know, for the other students who are there on time and learning. And I don't really know what to do about that. I just, I find it really distracting and I lose my train of thought. And then I just think it's, it's really just, you know, disrespectful. Well, I mean, part of what I'm hearing from you is that you care, right? That you've missed things and that they're sort of <laughs> shifting the, the environment you've created in the class with this disruption. Um, mm -hmm. And I know it can be really frustrating, right? Especially faculty, like I sense from you, that put a lot of time and effort into a lesson plan that's this really nice arc and package, right? And so if students have missed this brilliant bridge in and pre-assessment um, yeah. that, you've, that you've created to really set up the other learning that's coming, that can be really disheartening. Um, so sometimes what I would, and, and then at the same time, yeah, this kind of feeling of disrespect. So one thing that um, I tell faculty to do is, is sometimes say this from the start, say, you know, I know, you know, class is scheduled to start at one o'clock, maybe in your case. I know some of you are coming from other places, gonna be hungry, whatever. Um, it is around lunchtime. When I lesson plan, I really do it in a way of like a, a vision of the entire time we have together. So if you show up 20, 30 minutes late, you're gonna miss some really vital things. That's gonna be really hard to get you caught up. Um, of course, you're welcome to enter class anytime. I absolutely understand buses are late or maybe you have a work shift before you're coming from another class. So you're always welcome. The door will never be locked. But if you can make an effort to be here right from the start, you're going to get a better sense of like all of the content that I'm sharing. You're welcome to bring food, right? We And we know that students do have busy lives and and um, it's great if they're, they're coming into class and sharing a pizza, but um, Obviously, yeah, I want to minimize distraction and disruption. Another thing, Wanda, that is a really interesting conversation that a lot of us on the teaching and learning team often have with faculty are some intercultural awareness pieces that might may or may not come into play in your specific classroom, but I'll just mention them in case. But there are cultures in the world that are what we call more polychronic instead of monochronic. And we have a lot of workshops in teaching and learning about intercultural awareness and communication, but um, a lot of our international students especially come from cultures that are polychronic, which essentially means that they value relationships over being ruled by the clock. Mm. Folks, folks who were born and mm. raised in Southern Ontario tend to have more of a like monochronic, you know, we do interpret being late as a sign of disrespect, that type of thing. Um, and one of the things that's so fascinating about intercultural awareness is realizing like, oh, that's not the only way. Um, 
And so there's a, a number of different examples, right? But even, you know, my husband comes from France and I spent a lot of time there. We met when I was living there and I remember being really amazed. There was a, I went to see a, a theater play in France. It was scheduled to start at eight and I was there like in my seat, but then everyone was still talking in the lobby, drinking wine, whatever. It was like 8, 10, 8, 15. And I was thinking, what is going on? Like, I didn't get the memo. Does it actually start at nine? And no, it was, it actually starts at eight. It's just a polychronic culture that really values talking to each other and enjoying your wine and, you know, meeting with this reviewer. It's a night at the theater. It's not just about sitting there seeing the show at eight. And there's a number of cultures in the world like this, right? And so it's not to say one way is better than the other. It's just great that we have differences. But it's it's very possible that some of your students might not realize that you would interpret this as a sign of disrespect. They might, mm. you know, maybe they have a small gap in their schedule to socialize with their friends and they really value these relationships um, that's vital to their well-being, et cetera. And so... Mm might just think, okay, that makes a lot more sense to have a bit more social time and then come into class 20, 30 minutes late. Not to say that, you know, you don't want to um, gently educate them about this or just say, you know, it would be a workplace expectation here. You're welcome to join class at any time, but, you know, moving forward in your careers, this is just something to take into account that this particular, you know, culture of, of Canada tends to be more mono monochronic. Um, and so if something starts at a certain time, the expectation is that you'd be there. Um, and sometimes laying, you know, if if this kind of continues and they're still coming in late, even just laying out for them what your expectations are, even via email saying, you know, I've noticed that the mm -hmm. four of you are frequently coming in late, having lunch, totally fine. Always happy to have you here. But the noise is becoming difficult for the other learners. So what I'm going to ask you to do is when you enter the class and just lay it out, even like point form, right? Like open the door, <laughs> find your seat, quietly distribute your pizza without talking to each other, etc. Open your books, your computer, whatever it might be that they need in, in class that day. Um, because then it's sort of in writing and they have a bit of a, you know, guide, mm -hmm. <laughs> guide to follow as to how to enter and, and, you know, be welcomed into the space, but without, without being too disruptive. Okay. So you suggest I, I, I send an email. What about talking to them, you know, in class or, or after class? Yeah, you always could, right? You always could um, at break time say, oh, you know, I, I mentioned last week that it would be much better if you came in without talking, quietly took your seats. That didn't happen today. So I just wanted to check in with you about, you know, maybe why, what was up, like why that didn't happen today. And, and just to remind you gently, if it becomes an issue, and sometimes it does, right? Sometimes you're handling this very respectfully, very clearly, mm -hmm. and it continues. One other strategy you might want to employ is saying that you're going to have to start documenting it. Now, this won't necessarily go anywhere, right? This is just a tactic to, mm -hmm. um, to keep them in line and just to remind them how important this is. So let's say you've gone over this for two or three weeks. They're still coming in 30 minutes late, talking loudly. Everyone's distracted. Um, then you can say to them, okay, uh, at break time, you know, I'm gonna doc I'm gonna have to document this now. So on October 23rd, I noted that you came in at you know exactly 11:25 or 1:25, whatever time your class is. Um, you made a lot of noise, you shuffled seats, you, you know, brought it mm -hmm. to the other side of the room closer to your pizza. Mm -hmm. So I'm just documenting this and emailing all of you who were involved in this in this incident, right? So that feels it feels kind of yeah. powerful. There's this maybe sense underneath that this might go somewhere, uh, even if it won't necessarily. But that is, you know, that's a particular strategy that you can use too. That you know is also helpful for you. It's always good to have a paper trail yeah. of when okay. you've communicated these things to students and how. Okay. Okay, well, that's some good ideas. I'll see if I can try that. It's just, it's all very different than I pictured. Um, I mean, I never would have thought that that they would behave like this at, you know, college, university, post-secondary level. It's like some of them are not even interested in being there and they don't really even care about the grades that they're getting. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I can understand why it might seem like that. I mean, it sounds to me from what you're saying that maybe the students you actually have who are really showing up are not the ones you envisioned maybe before mm. the semester began. And that happens. Oftentimes, I, I do hear this from faculty too. I think there's a couple of things at play. So on the one hand, they did show up, right? I hear that it maybe some some of their behaviors in class might make it seem like they don't actually want to be there, but they did make an effort to show up in spite of everything else they have going on in their life. So they, they've come for a reason. And, um, you know, we are we are there to teach who shows up on any given day. And one of the things that's interesting about when I consult with a lot of faculty, I think for many of us, we liked school, right? If we went on to, you know, get undergrad, master's, PhD sometimes, we have got a lot of very, you know, high achieving academics at this institution who are now teaching. And so we were probably a particular brand of student. We did care about, you know, getting top marks and grades, et cetera. The system really worked for us. Um, we found a sort of literacy mm -hmm. to navigate our way through it. And that's not the case for all of our students, right? And some of them do just want to pass. They're not interested in going on to do future degrees or apply for scholarships. So it doesn't really matter to them if they get a 55 and pass the course or if they get a 90. Um, I've often seen students, you know, who let's say they do, you know, kind of just well enough to get their 55 in the course before the final. And then sometimes they don't even show up to write the final. And I'll think, oh, why did you do that? Like you could have boosted your mark. And they would say, but I just wanted to pass. That was just my you know, my objective of taking this course and doing this program. And it's hard for me, it's not my mentality, it's hard for me to accept that all the time, but that is their reality. And they're they're still my student. And that's a choice that they're making. They're an adult and yeah. that's the choice. And, you know, I can always encourage them and say, I've, ha I've seen in the past people who think they're passing and then miscalculate. And so I'd suggest writing the final, you know, this could, this could happen, but ultimately it's, it's their decision. And I, I mean, sometimes too, a number of students might, especially say international students who are planning their lives um, in Canada, and maybe there's a particular program that they've started in here that um, isn't ultimately what they want to do for their careers. That's still okay, right? Even if they're not super passionate about the subject matter or care as deeply about it as you do, um, it's still part of their journey. And even if it reaffirms for them at the end of the semester, oh, I don't actually want to be a baker. <laughs> mm. You know, that's okay. They've learned something. You are still modeling, you know, welcoming behaviors to them, teaching them to the best of your ability. Certainly they got something out of the course. And then maybe they're going to realize I actually want to be a truck driver. And that's where their career takes them. But if they're, you know, if they've paid to be in your course, they they're going to show up in, in whatever capacity <laughs> fits with the part of the journey that they're on. And uh, yeah, it makes it makes for a more diverse classroom experience, certainly. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and we adapt our, our teaching accordingly. Oh, one more thing I just thought of. Mm -hmm. um, so I also have a couple of students in my class that are really eager, which is great, but I'm finding it hard to kind of balance because I have the ones that are always like putting their hands up, always, you know, saying answers. And then I have, you know, a lot of others who just want to sit there and listen and they don't offer anything. And I'm not sure if it's because they don't have anything to offer, they don't want to, or they're not because these two other students are kind of overtaking all of the answers all the time. Yeah, that is, that is also common. And I mean, as faculty, it's interesting to be in that position, right? Because on the one hand, you're very grateful for these one or two or three mm. students that are really eager to answer all of your brilliantly crafted questions. But at the same time, it's almost like they've been unofficially elected, like the spokespeople for the class, right? And others might feel like, okay, well, they take up the space all the time. So there's a couple of different strategies, I'd say, for encouraging greater participation. So one of the most, you know, if you're doing kind of a direct instruction approach and you're, you have a question on the board that you want folks to respond to and the usual suspects do, you might say something like, okay, I want to hear, you know, I haven't heard from, you know, the back left in a while. Anyone mm -hmm. back there have anything they'd like to share? So that might just, you know, be a subtle message to those that you have heard a lot from that you're interested in other voices and perspectives. Um, sometimes that works, sometimes doesn't, depends on the students. 
Other times I might then think, okay, I'm going to actually break this down into a think pair share. So it's going to take slightly longer, but to answer this question before you share with the class, I want you to turn to the person beside you or work with the group at your table and answer it in your group, right? And write down, write down your answers so you don't forget them because I'm sure there's really smart things coming out of these conversations. And then um, I'm going to, you know, ask a few groups to share with the wider group. So that kind of warms up a lot of students, this, this kind of thing, giving them a bit of extra time so they're not totally on the spot. And then to share their, their kind of pair sharing where they're practicing, basically saying their, their idea out loud and realizing like, oh yeah, others are validating it. That's a smart idea. They have that confidence to then bring it to the wider group. So I have a lot of success with, with that strategy. Um, and then, of course, there's other ones. And in Teaching and Learning, we do a lot of workshops, say, about Mentimeter, right? So maybe sometimes to get more participation that's anonymous, you might have a word cloud or something in Mentimeter that then you say, okay, I want you all to type in three words about how you feel about this particular situation or this scenario, whatever it might be. Um, and so then they're participating and you're getting a sense and then let's say on the word cloud, the word, I don't know, disappointed pops up really big. So you know that's a cue for yourself. Oh, a lot of people said that word. So I'm not going to put anyone on the spot, but I might just say, hey, does anyone who said the word disappointed want to expand on why they find this scenario disappointing? So then it's like, a again, a, a subtle invitation um, for some people you wouldn't often hear, <laughs> hear from ordinarily. What about if I have some students who never say anything? Can I just, can I ask them and just say, hey, we haven't heard from you yet. Can, you know, Adil, can you offer something on this? Yeah, great question, Wanda. So sometimes that works, right? And there are, I have, even with faculty, I've worked when I'm teaching courses for faculty, I've gotten to know a few folks who are waiting for that actual invitation <laughs> to, for me to actually say their name. Hey, I'd love to hear what you think about this. Sometimes it can work, but it can also create a bit of a, an unsafe environment for certain learners if they feel like they could be called on at any point. So one strategy that I really like, and I would set this, you know, at the, even at this point in the semester, but I'd say it, you know, at the start of class is that I really, I really value hearing from a lot of different um, people in this room. Mm -hmm. We're all here to, you know, construct knowledge together and your experience matters a lot. And I feel like I haven't been hearing from enough folks. So I'm going to start, um, uh, this approach where I'm going to call you out, right? So I might say, Adil, do you have anything to share about this? But you always reserve the right to say path, right? So if if I do come to you and you're not ready to answer that question or you're just having a bad day and you don't want to speak in front of people, you can just say path and that's totally fine. You're always welcome to do that. There's going to be no, you know, this is not being evaluated. It's just really that I care about what you're thinking. Okay. And so if you start to put this into practice, um, you know, it's students do seem to be a little bit more present knowing that they might be called on. So they are listening a little more intently in my experience, but they all also have that safe out. And then if they do say pass, just take it in stride and say, oh, okay, sounds good. Okay, let's go over to you, Amanda, and right. you know, keep working down that way. Okay. And what do you do? Oh, it's the worst when a student says something that's clearly the wrong answer or not at all what your question was. Um, I want them to participate, but I don't really know what to do because I don't want to kind of call them out and say, oh, you know, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want the rest of the class to get confused. Yeah, <laughs> great, great question. And that is always kind of uncomfortable when it happens, right? Just like you're saying, you want it to feel safe for everyone to contribute. And so if you were to come down hard and say, uh, nope, that's not the answer I was looking for, others might then feel unsafe to contribute as well. So typically when students um, offer something in class, they're looking for, you know, different things. So they might be looking for validation, this kind of like, um, you know, let's say I'm going to just pull out an example. Like, let's say you're talking about microaggressions and you say, what are some examples of microaggressions that you've seen? And one student raises their hand and says, you know, the fact that for so long you could only buy like kind of pink or peachy colored band-aids that you could validate that. You would say, yes, um, yes, that's a powerful example of a microaggression, right? So it's not something that's putting someone's life at stake, but if you are a person with a different skin color and you walk into a store to buy band-aid, these things add up, right? So yes, excellent example of a microaggression. Um, 
sometimes it might be essentially like elaboration. So let's say I was consulting on a course recently about um, sort of health inspectors and food safety. And so let's say you, you've asked the class, okay, what are, what are some important steps of you know, prudent hand washing? And maybe one student raises their hand and you know, gives two of the six. So you could, you could use this kind of elaboration technique. Saying, mm. Okay, so Sasha has started us off really well here. She said, you know, there's the importance of, you know, scrubbing between your fingers, whatever it might be. Um, and then we also want to remember that there's, you know, a really important step at the end. What how, how do we keep our hands clean when we also have to turn off the tap? Who can remind us? So you can fill in some of the blanks for students and they still feel somewhat validated. And then if their answer is really unexpected or way out in left field and you've got a course correct, I would always start by saying thank you. So yeah, you know, uh, thank you, Doris, for uh, for sharing that. Um, I'm wondering if you could explain your thinking a little more behind that. And this is often really revealing, and it, you can kind of shift things and put it back on you because there's probably others in the class thinking, "Ooh, that was not correct." But if you put it on this, they say, "Explain your thinking, okay?" Um, and then they start to do so. You could then put it back on yourself and say, "Ah, okay, that's really interesting." that you, you know, interpreted what I said last week in that way. I don't think I explained that clearly enough. Um, and there's probably a lot of people in the room who are kind of confused about that. So I'm gonna clarify and then you can go back. <laughs> so that's one, one sort of magic trick I find to still make the student feel good and almost like they did you a favor by giving this wrong mm -hmm. answer because now you can, you can correct it for everyone. Mm -hmm. and you kind of take the blame <laughs> for it. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks. I'll try those out. Um, I do have to run to another meeting, but I just wanted to share one more kind of strange, um, you know, bizarre thing that's kind of happening. Um, I have a lot of students that submit work late and um, I get some really interesting excuses. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sick and I'm not going to be back on Tuesday, so I can't submit or you know, I need to go to the bank to, you know, open my GIC, um, you know, during class at this time. So um, I'm not going to be there or I'm not going to be able to submit my um, assignment. Yeah. And I don't, you know, how, how do you, how do you know you're going to be sick on, on Tuesday? It's yeah, the plan, the plan illnesses are, <laughs> are interesting ones for sure. So a couple of things, I mean, and this will vary a little bit program to program. So you'd want to look at your program handbook. There are certain programs at the college that are very strict with late deadlines and, you know, okay. just can't be accepted after three days, whatever it might be. And then your hands are a little bit tied as a faculty member with extensions. But in other programs, there is a bit of leniency and it's somewhat up to your discretion. So I like to use the rule where I say, you know, I understand things come up. Maybe time management is tricky with juggling so many courses and other life things and paid work. So if you do think you're going to need an extension, email me at least 48 hours in advance, right? So that could help kind of resolve that plan, that plan sickness. If they know they have an outright, they can come to me. I'd say 48 hours in advance because then um, it still makes them a little bit responsible for their, their time management. <clears throat> then they can also see that I, I am being generous. And so... Um, then we work it out. We say, okay, how many more days do you think you need, etc. So it's a little bit more of an honest exchange. Students do get sick too. And we can't, you know, we don't request medical notes. Sometimes we just do get sick and that happens to everyone. Mm -hmm. So I tend to advise faculty too, just to bias for best. Even if you sense maybe they're not actually sick, respond to the email and say, oh, wow, I'm really sorry to hear that. I hope you feel better soon. Um, and propose maybe another deadline. Say, okay, it was due on Tuesday uh, to keep on track with my own grading. Do you think you'd be able to submit it by this Thursday? Um, you know, if you if you agree to this now, we can arrange to do that without penalty, whatever it might be according to the, the okay. hand. And then also it's interesting, this GIC example, um, it might seem kind of bizarre, but a lot of international students do have to have it's a kind of regulation where they do have to have a GIC. And so sometimes these are difficult to arrange with banks. And so if they did, okay. that might not be just an excuse. In this case, mm -hmm. it might be actually the only time that they could fit in a bank appointment. And this is sort of vital to their 
remaining in the country and remaining at the college. So, um, yeah, that, that, that might <laughs> that might really be true. Okay. Yeah. Those are, those are good things to know. Um, yeah. Moving forward. Um, <clears throat> thanks again for, for meeting with me today. I do have to go to another meeting, but, um, I've taken lots of notes and I really appreciate all of your time and, um, your advice. And, uh, I hope, to be able to maybe reach out again and just, you know, let you know how things are going or if anything else comes up. Um, love that. I'd love to have a little check in if you're willing in a couple of weeks, let me know how some of these strategies are working. And of course, you know, in teaching and learning every month, we have different courses and workshops on these topics. Mm. If you want to delve more deeply into some of these discussions with colleagues, right. Who are, you'll see are having very similar experiences. Mm -hmm. And then we have our faculty learning hub with some great links and, and advice. And then of course, yeah, always available for one-on-one -on -one consults like this too for specifics. Okay, I'm gonna try and check out some of those workshops. Thanks, that's a good idea. No problem, great to connect with you, Wanda. Okay, bye Lauren, thanks. Okay, bye.